You know, growing up, I was constantly told by my parents and other relatives, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So I waited and waited, and now I have some nice things to say. So let's wrap up what I think about the Intrepid 8x10. Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Mirage. If this is your first time stopping by the channel, I recommend giving a subscribe because we have over 100 videos in the Large Format Friday series, and every few weeks we're going to be here and we're going to be talking about something large format. Now, I know it's been a while since I've mentioned anything actual large format on this channel, and hopefully today we'll dive into why that is. Some of it's me, some of it's this camera, but let's get into it. So to tell the full story about Intrepid and my history with them, we need to go all the way back to June of 2017, when they first announced their intent to make an 8x10 inch view camera. This was so exciting to me because I had never been in large format at a time where a new camera was less than a thousand US dollars. And this one was around 500 US dollars. And that was so, so exciting. I, as well as a bunch of other people in the, like the film and blogging sphere were really excited because we knew this would bring so many new people into large format, people that wouldn't have even considered it or that's this type of photography as an option due to the barrier of price. And I wrote a pretty nice fluff piece about it, considering I hadn't even seen any Intrepid cameras. And just on the premise of a cheap camera, I was really excited. At the time, I was working at a retail establishment, Midwest Photo, where I was buying and selling used film camera equipment. And I saw a lot of cameras come through, but many of them were overly priced. At the time, lenses were still not terrible. And film prices were, you know, doing what they always do, increasing. They're, of course, way more now, but it wasn't too bad. I was so stoked about the camera, but my, my optimism quickly faded as I started getting direct emails from Film Photography Podcast listeners who said, I saw your article. I was so excited. I immediately kickstarted it. And when I got my camera, the thing was falling apart. The first generation of the 8x10 Intrepid was... It was an attempt. The camera had a kind of a similar construction to what these new ones do, but there was far more wood on there, less machined aluminum, way more 3D printed parts, and the polymer used for the 3D printing was pretty weak. There were knobs breaking everywhere, and it didn't leave a good taste in anyone's mouth. And I was even considering pulling down that blog post because I felt like it was leading people into a camera that wasn't going to serve them well. And I didn't want that to be the case. When the second generation of Intrepid cameras was announced, I shared the announcement and I, I gave a few opinions on it, but this time I remained way more cautiously optimistic than I had before. I personally didn't have my hands on a second gen Intrepid until one came into Midwest Photo for purchase, and it already looked like it had been through the ringer, even though the user had said it was only on one backpacking trip with them. So, I, again, I was like, oh man, this the screws shouldn't be falling out of here where the front standard goes and the knobs shouldn't be like falling up, like missing. But it, it did. And uh, I was, I was kind of starting to feel down. So fast forward to April 2022, Intrepid sent me a message saying, hey, we're going to have our newest generation of 4x5 and 8x10 cameras coming out. Would you like to try one? I like instantly replied saying, yes, put me on the list. If I have to put a deposit down or pay shipping, whatever, that's great. I'd be happy to try it out. I'd love to take it in the field and, and actually like be there when the new one drops so I can give it my, my honest take. And that pretty much takes us to where I left off on the channel. I got this camera in September and I gave it an initial field review where I took it out to a local park near a quarry and did some waterfalls, did a little bit of hiking with it, and gave you my initial thoughts. It's also pretty cool that Intrepid gave a discount code if anybody did want to pre-order the camera then and save a little bit. According to some viewers of this channel, that coupon code is still good, so uh, Matt Mirage 10 will save you 10% on these. Let's talk specs for the Gen 3 Intrepid camera. On the front standard, we have a rise of 70 millimeters and a fall of 60 millimeters that's possible. We have some front shifts, so left to right shifting, that allows us plus or minus 30 millimeters. So we have a plus or minus 50 degree tilt that happens along the lens axis, and we have a plus or minus 50 degree swing that happens along that center axis where you also do your shift. Moving to the rear standard, we have a, rear, a backwards tilt of 35 degrees and a forwards tilt of up to 90 degrees, which makes sense because that's how we fold the camera. 
When the camera is folded, it is only 75 millimeters tall, and then the back is a 295 millimeter square, making it one of the smaller frames possible. Total weight though, where this really comes in handy, total weight is 2.8 kilograms or 6.2 pounds. When folded out into the shooting position, this has a minimum bellows extension of 100 millimeters and a maximum bellows extension of 550 millimeters. Included with the camera is a ground glass screen with a one half inch grid with the Fresnel or magnifying lens available separately. On the bottom where it attaches to the tripod, you have quarter inch 20 thread mount and a 3 8 inch 16 compatible mount. I recommend using both when possible, especially if you're using a quick release plate, but otherwise just pop it in the 3 8 inch and you'll be good to go. As far as lens boards, they are the same size as a Cinar, so a 140 millimeter square board, but they do not fit every single Cinar board. I found the official Cinar boards and some of the older Horseman boards do not fit, even though they look like they should fit, and that is due to some of the felting and the cutout in the front of the frame. As far as lenses, Intrepid recommends using lenses 180 millimeters to 550 millimeters. And we're gonna get back to the lens situation here in a bit. So up until working with the Intrepid 8x10, a lot of my previous experience has been working with an older style focusing system. It's known as a rack and pinion. And that rack and pinion shifts by unlocking stuff on the left hand side and pushing the lens forward with the rack with this screw on the front. You also have on some cameras, screws in the back and that allow you to shift things forward to really scrunch those bellows together. On the Intrepid, the focusing system is a tad different where all you have is this singular drive screw in the back. That makes it very easy for working with long lenses, but it does make it kind of tedious if you need to quickly assemble the camera. Like for example, if the light is just, you know, happening amazingly fast and you need to like rack that camera out, there's no like quick way to pull the focus without stripping that singular drive gear. <laughs> On this Rack and Pinion style camera, you can kind of bully it around, but there is wood and brass and sometimes it gets nice and squeaky. Some obvious differences between this one and this one, the Tachihara is more than double the weight of the Intrepid. That means it's a heftier camera, it means I can carry around less lenses and less film to shoot on the same size backpack. I just explained what makes this camera different from my everyday 8x10 Tachihara camera, and that required me to relearn some things. So upon receiving this camera, I started to relearn the dance. That's the series of movements you need to do to unlock the camera, open it up, focus it, and get it ready for shooting. Even if there's a few steps that are out of order or use a different tool, it takes time to unlearn those patterns. Things are gonna be similar, but there may be deliberately different steps. For me, it was getting used to this singular drive screw in the back and just how tight this thing folds together. It always feels like I'm gonna like hurt the bellows and I have gotten a few wrinkles on the side here over time, but it's not so bad. For that first week, I didn't actually shoot the camera. I just learned the dance and tried to get it out and get to the point where I was gonna take a picture and then I tore it back down. I did the same thing when I got the 12 by 20 camera and I try to do the same thing whenever I work with any new camera. So after that first week of playing around, I invited my buddy Tariq Terry out to lunch. You may have seen Tariq on the channel before when we did our eight by 10 Polaroid experiments, hanging out in the studio. He's my go-to guy anytime I wanna share something neat and exciting in large format. So we went out to a late lunch down at the North Market in downtown Columbus. We had some awesome food and I brought just my tiny Tenba shoulder bag, the one I normally only have film holders in, but I was able to load my Intrepid, my standard lens, my Fuji wide angle lens, my 250, as well as a couple of film holders. Tariq was flabbergasted that the whole thing fit in what looked like a regular shoulder bag. And he was immediately like, oh my gosh, can we shoot it? And I was like, yes. I brought some black and white film. I had some more FPP Mummy 400 loaded up and that was gonna be perfect for doing just some like environmental portraits in the, uh, in the early evening. We were both really pleased with how easy the camera was to set up and use. Uh, we both did note that the focusing did feel like it took a lot when we used the standard lens on there. We were pushing it out and it did feel like it took longer than the cameras we're used to using. I have my Tachihara and he has his Wista, which is very, very similar to a Tachihara. So that took some getting used to. But in the span of less than 10 minutes, we'd taken three portraits. I did a wider shot of Tariq, a closer up shot of Tariq, and he flipped around and did a close up of me. 
I was so excited that same day that I filmed a quick TikTok slash YouTube short and I uploaded that the next day to talk about all the things that I was really hyped about on this camera and I felt a little more confident practicing with it on camera. Later on that weekend, I took the camera out to the Quarry Trails Park and I filmed what is now the 8x10 initial overview, which was kind of my only showcasing of the Intrepid to any large degree here on the channel. So when I was down at Quarry Trails early in the morning doing some black and white frickin' trees and waterfalls, you know, all the stuff I like to share in my fieldwork series, I was pretty surprised at how easy the camera was to use with the included Fresnel. I did still need the dark cloth when I was shooting pretty backlit, but the camera did pretty decently. One thing I probably should have read in the manual that Intrepid sent me is that they do allow for wider angle lenses like 150 millimeters, but there's an asterisk here, and that asterisk is for using recessed lens boards. This camera, while the bellows can scrunch to 100 millimeters, you're going to need something to push it further back. If your plans are to use this camera with anything really wider than 180 or 210 millimeters, you might want to look at something like a recessed lens board, especially if you're gonna do things like movements. All the things I liked about this camera in the overview video still remain the same, but there were two shots out of the overview video that for some reason just like looked a little softer than I was used to. I chalked it up to maybe I was rushing with the camera and there are a couple close-up shots you could even see in that video where just the act of me peeling back the frame, the spring back frame on here, uh, shook the camera a little bit and I was like, maybe, maybe that's what it was. They were some longer exposures, totally could be on me. So when I scanned up those shots that uh, Tariq took of me and I took of him, I also noticed all three of those we're just like a little bit softer. And I was like, huh, the landscape shots, you know, two out of four, uh, not terrible. They probably looked okay on the YouTube video. But then the shots I did of Tariq, like man, two for two, these things were holding still. And Tariq is like, he is a rock when it comes to holding still for large format. He is no stranger to the process. So I was like, ah, maybe, maybe it's that same camera shake that I was experiencing. It could potentially even be like uh, the slight diopter or focusing capability on a loop. By the way, if you have a loop that has a diopter, once you get that thing set, you really don't want it to move because if you start focusing this and not the ground glass, you're gonna be focusing on the wrong plane. So with two black and white shoots down, a video overview and some quick YouTube shorts, TikToks, I thought maybe I wanna go the extra mile and put a little more effort into reviewing this camera. I wanna set up some special shoots where I'm shooting specifically color. So I loaded up some Portra 160 into a bunch of holders and I got ready to take this camera down on vacation with me down to Savannah, Georgia. It was awesome, it was so relaxing. The weather was amazing compared to Ohio and I went to some of my absolute favorite places to visit when I'm down south. I went to some of the old cemeteries in Savannah, namely Bonaventure Cemetery. When that light is just coming in from behind the Spanish moss in those live oaks, ah, oh, it's amazing. Now I don't have too much footage from Savannah because I didn't bring my digital camera. I brought an old timey film camera. We'll, we'll talk about that another day. But overall I ended up exposing like six or seven sheets a few family portraits of Lauren and the dogs at the beach house, as well as a few on the beach and at the Bonaventure Cemetery. Even though I'd already shot a little bit of color and some black and white, I put a few extra shoots on the schedule with the help of my buddy Tariq to do some natural light portraits, as well as some lit studio portraits with off-camera flash. So one of the first shoots on the docket was a black and white natural light shoot with Mariama. Mariama is awesome. She's currently working with Tariq on his Fulani project. They're, they're an awesome team and Mariama is just a sweetheart for putting up with all of our camera shenanigans. We brought the Intrepid out. We did some Avedon style natural light with a piece of white foam core as our backdrop and some north light shadows to give us just that right amount of diffused even light. Super easy to work with and I got pretty close with my 355 standard lens doing those portraits. We also pulled Mariama into the studio to do one other lighting test where we used kind of some darker black flags uh, to give us some really, really nice texture on her face and let the background go just kind of this very, very soft dark gray. Alongside testing for the Kentmere 120 for Medium Format Monday from a few months ago, we also shot some color frames with the Intrepid 8x10. Now the key word there is color. All the color I shot on vacation in Savannah, as well as the color I shot from those model shoots, 
was all lumped together because I still don't trust myself processing color film. So I collect all of my color film and try to send it as one or two batches to the lab. By the time my color film from vacation, as well as the studio shoots that I had organized with Tariq, that processing turnaround time, it was like Thanksgiving, so late November. I'd already had the camera in my possession for a couple months and I was feeling really, really good about it. And looking at that color film as it came back from the lab was an absolute gut punch. I could tell from the naked eye that the pictures were all soft. And upon scanning them, I noticed one other thing that was really, really concerning. Every single picture was focused a little bit to the front. Like just that extra little push on the knob, like that little half or quarter turn, everything was slightly focused to the front. And there is that, you know, there is that room for doubt. Maybe it's the model. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna rescan everything that I did prior to this, before I went on vacation. And I reevaluated those quarry trail shots and those portraits that me and Tariq took of each other. And that's when alarm bells started going off. Everything was front focused. And it's fine when I'm front focusing and it's fine if like a model moves, but the shot Tariq took of me also being front focused, I'm fine blaming myself, but like I know Tariq is not, he's not that guy. He doesn't do that. He, his hits are way more than his misses when it comes to large format. So now I knew something was up. It wasn't just me, it was also Tariq. It was also every single frame, every single film, bunch of different holders, bunch of different loops. There was only one common denominator at this point. About 10, 11 days go by after being completely disillusioned with how I am as a photographer, how the shoots went, and how almost every single picture is unusable at this point. A few of them at a really high f-stop were fine, but pretty much all of this effort and all of this film completely bum. And then I get this email. Hi Matt, just to let you know, the production team have identified a potential issue with a small batch of eight x 10 cameras, which likely includes yours. The height of the tabs where the ground glass sits seem to have been cut slightly wrong on a very small number of early cameras. It will affect close focus on wider apertures, but otherwise be unnoticeable, so you may not have experienced any problems. We've sent a replacement back out to you, so just switch them over and no need to send the old one back. You can keep that glass as a spare. Best, Intrepid. And that's the reason why you haven't heard me say anything about the Intrepid camera for quite a long time. I put in a ton of effort. The amount of planning, cost of my time, and especially other people's time and expectations to get some photos, that's all gone. So yes, you know, I didn't pay for this camera. Intrepid sent it to me, they covered shipping, and they even sent a replacement just like they would. It arrived in just a few days. So all of that, they did completely the right thing. But kind of at that point, the damage was already done. So a couple days after receiving that email and still kind of mad at this point, I open the package to find one of these. There's a couple screw holes at the top here and those go into the spring back. It's two very small little Allen screws and about a minute later and I had the back replaced. But that's not the part I was mad about. A 1.5 millimeter height difference in where they placed the ground glass was the difference between all but two ruined shots and what would have been almost a 100% hit rate. Personally, I know a lot of photographers working in large format and even a few of them being YouTubers that did not have nice things to say about the Atrepid and even warned me. And I really just wanted to remain positive. And that's why I have been quiet for so long. I didn't want my story of this to be like the beginning of my villain arc. Like this is why I'm just gonna hate on cameras forever. But all of this extra time has allowed me to take a step back, assess, you know, who it is that wants this camera and who it is that's gonna find the most use from this camera. And that's what I wanna talk about now. If you're someone that's into DIY, 3D printing, knows when you cobble something together, you're gonna need to work on it yourself, this camera's gonna be fine for you. It's also an excellent option for someone that's doing maybe long distance through hiking. You're backpacking in and out, all the things you need to shoot and live. Kind of like what Ben Horn was doing with some of his earlier generation Intrepids. The good news, this doesn't need cinched down with paracord like he had to do with his, so that's a plus. 
I could also see this being used for someone that wants to travel with their large format kit, but maybe not ship their larger, more expensive 8x10 camera to a location. Is this a camera that I'm gonna recommend for everybody? No. If you're someone that appreciates craftsmanship and quality, you are gonna find things all over this camera that you're not gonna like. One thing that I struggled with a lot when I was in the field were these two screws right back here. This needs one, two, three twists. So one and a half revolutions, and this thing is off the standard. So far, I've lost both of these knobs in the back of my car. I did find them a week later on vacation. I lost one set of the screws in Tariq's studio when I was trying to fold the camera down. I guess this is kind of nitpicky, but also on this camera, you have at least seven different sizes of fasteners, so screws, but they're also in different makes. There's a lot of Allen keys, but there's also a star bit and a few Phillips bits. Likely this means if you're traveling in the field with this camera and you're gonna be working with it in changing conditions, you're gonna to have to travel with a complete Allen key set as well as a Phillips head and a star bit. So that's just more stuff to carry around. And these don't come with the cameras. One thing I was impressed with, even though I had unintentionally and intentionally folded the bellows wrong on this camera, it held up fine. The bellows never cracked. I never felt like I was going to pinch them. They are still pretty pliable and that part of it has been, uh, has been good. In terms of personal opinion on the camera, I was really surprised to see just how thick the aluminum was on the lens board. This aluminum is actually the same thickness as what's on the bed of this camera. It is only 569 US dollars for the Intrepid, but how much would it really cost to make an even sturdier aluminum frame? You're literally giving us a lens board for like less than 50 bucks, which has more aluminum on it than the entire bottom of this camera. If you do get an Intrepid camera, here's my recommendations. Put it on a sturdy tripod. I am showing it right now on this compact tripod, and that's because my Tachihara is on my heavier one right there. A heavier duty tripod is nice. It's a couple pounds more. It's quite a bit more expensive, but it's gonna guarantee, even during those long exposures, that things are gonna settle down. So that's a good thing. Lighter weight lenses are also gonna be really nice. So if you're looking to do, you know, big, beautiful bokeh where you have like F5.6, F4, F3.2, some massive thing, uh, it's not gonna go too well on the front of this camera. If you're gonna be doing super, super up close work, so 550 millimeters sounds like a lot, but that's a 300 millimeter lens all the way out for an up close portrait. So less than a few feet away, you're getting like a hyper close up near macro. It's not gonna be a good camera for macro. It's also not gonna be too great for super wide angle. So 150 millimeter lens is like a 24-ish millimeter equivalent on eight by 10, but that isn't the widest you can get. And there are dedicated wide angle cameras that are gonna fare much better. So that's, uh, that's kind of it. Um, I'm not someone that gives like rating numbers, you know, value, it's 11 out of 10. Uh, everything else, eh, out of 10. There you go. If you have any other questions about the Intrepid 8x10, please feel free to leave those down below in the comments. Do you have an Intrepid? What do you think so far of the Gen 3? And uh, what would you do differently in a camera? I really wanna know, let's keep this conversation open. And yeah, that's it. I still wanna keep things super positive in the words of my buddy Michael Rosso at the FPP. And even after all of this stuff with this camera and the back and forth, I still enjoy large format, but it did take me a while to bounce back. Thanks again for stopping by and uh, hope to see you in a few more weeks for more large format Friday.